So we're in the situation where we're, we're you know, worried about automating work and the, the most human work is the most difficult to automate. Um, and we're, we're essentially turning humans into autom automatons by, by measuring every aspect of their behavior as if they're machines, right? Humans are not machines. That's why they're great. Uh, and we shouldn't lose that. We shouldn't lose sight of that. Are we? Yes. Where are we? Here. Why are we here? Not entirely clear. We are misfits thrust into existence by random chance with no hints at all as to how we're supposed to make sense of it all. It's immensely bizarre. Here we are. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Here We Are podcast. I am Shane Moss, and I am putting together many of you that have been following along might have known that I also have a show called Mind Under Matter with me and my artist and comedian friend, Ramin Nazer, where we kind of take a lot of things from this show and, and make it more philosophical, loose, less accurate, and more funny, and that sort of, <laughs> that sort of thing, um, it, because we're wrong about a bunch of things. Um, but we have a, uh, we have a camp out festival coming out in Raleigh, 20 minutes southeast of downtown, September 9th through 11th with camping until Monday the 12th. There's day passes available as well, but we encourage you guys uh, to camp out for the communal vibe. Um, and uh, my guest today is coming all the way from Purdue to attend and participate in the festival. So I am exceptionally excited to welcome my guest, Tara Barrand, everybody. Tara, thank you so much for joining me. Thanks for having me. So tell everyone about yourself. Oh, gosh, sure. Uh, so I'm an organizational psychologist. What that means is we study uh, people at work, what makes them motivated, how to help them perform better, how to shape them through their careers, train and select people for that for open positions. Uh, so quite a range of, of different applications, but the, the common thread is how do people behave at work and how can we help them optimize their well-being and performance? Amazing. I've, I've heard about this work stuff. Um, <laughs> it sounds like there is, it, it, it sounds like from a psychological perspective that there is just a whole lot going on there, especially in, uh, in we, we talk a lot about evolution on this show and kind of the, the various pressures that, uh, that shaped our physiology and our, in our minds. And, um, and, and one of my favorite topics is, uh, is some of the mismatches with our uh with our more modern society and uh it, this is this is the very first time in this sliver of time in existence that any organism has kind of organized itself in some sort of cubicle structure and been able to have these things called corporations and, uh, and, 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 and we know about like worker ants and things like that. But, but what, what we're doing now to build this very impressive and complex society that we all live in, in these massive cities and these massive organizations uh, is, is, strange <laughs> in so many ways and i i think that i think that intuitively um what from like a business stand standpoint or a ceo standpoint uh would consider um a healthy work life and productivity is not always necessarily what gets the most productivity and creativity and well-being and employee retention things like that out of people. I think you're totally right. I mean, there's there's nothing natural about spending 40 hours a week in a windowless cubicle. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, and organizations were certainly not designed uh, thoughtfully. I won't even say that they were designed at all in most cases. I think in, in a lot of cases, it's a game of follow the leader because you, you hear about a corporation trying something, maybe it's you know, remote offices or open offices or whatever, and then you want to try it. Uh, but there's, there's this funny aspect of, of our perception, which is 
called the naturalistic fallacy. It means that we assume that whatever is around us is right, right? That it should be that way. Uh, and, yeah. and so we don't really question, is there a better way to design work? Uh, we assume right. that this is normal and, and because it's always been this way. But of course, if you look in history, it's not always been this way. There's no reason that it has to be this way in the future. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, uh, I, I thought, um, I had a guest on recent, another person that's going to be at the, um, at the, at the camp out, uh, who studies human evolution and it's a paleontologist, Stephen Churchill at Duke, who, um, who kind of, this ended up at the time that I heard it, you know, it didn't, it didn't seem all that profound really. And then it just keeps on popping up in my mind. Um, but he kind of talked about, human existence that we're all sort of born into this thing that's like some sort of amnesia of sorts that we're just kind of born into what we're born into and we and we don't have a a real memory of it and clear understanding of our past even even when we try and maybe know know a little bit about the last hundred years of life or something like that there's just a lot missing it's just not possible our lifespans are not long enough right. to become wise <laughs> so we, we really have to count right. on each other. <laughs> and, uh, and you kind of touched on uh, survivorship bias as well, where, where you kind of look to the top, which to me has always seemed like a little more of a male <laughs> thing to like recognize status and think like this is what it's all about or whatever. And that all-star player is representative of of uh, you know what it takes to play that sport or be a be a good worker or whatever and 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 man there there are there are people out there that have even even though they worked really hard and everything else they had so many other things that just came together in a certain way at the right time and sort of hit the lottery of sort not that they didn't work for it but hit the lottery of sorts into and and we're and we we're such social creatures that kind of mimic so much too that there's this natural inclination to be like well I guess I guess that's how you're successful in this day and age and you don't see all the people that did the exact same thing or even something even more impressive that failed horrifically yeah exactly I mean that's that's survivorship bias in a nutshell but it's also fundamental to the way that human beings learn which is to watch other people and try what they're doing. Right. That's a that's a really mm -hmm. great way to learn new things. And the problem is that it doesn't really apply to complex systems where you don't have all the information you need. So you might not realize all the variables that went into making Apple successful. Uh, and and if you ask right. people who are successful, their memory is imperfect because they're going to make themselves the hero of their own story. We're all on that journey. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. Uh, you, you read, you read any, I caught, I caught breaks kind of early on in my career before I was into uh, science as, as much as I am now, especially into like how the mind works and, and um, both me as an individual giving interviews, but, but also the reporter, it's like, you can't just be like, Hey, this comedian got on this and that and caught this and that break. You, you really need to, the trials and tribulations and fought stage fright and climbed their way through the ranks of this and that. And I look back on that, like I was drunk most of the time. <laughs> yeah. I, you know, I wish more people would, would um, think about the role of luck in their own success. And I, I think most people, if they put the effort into it, can pinpoint a few turning points where things could have gone very differently for them. Uh, and, yeah. and their success is, is clearly a function of randomness in the universe, but that's scary, right? We don't like to think of the universe as a random and scary place where anything could happen. And so it's much more comforting right. to tell ourselves that the world has rules and that good people get good things and bad people get bad things. And then we can rest easy. Yeah. 
yeah, the more of that predictability and control that you can have a sense of feeling over life. Feeling it is, seems more important to uh, a given individual than actually experiencing it. Right. Well, what's and, what's the objective? There is no objective in this case, right? Your perception is everything. And and feeling a sense of autonomy and control is fundamental to our well-being. I mean, that's why uh, jail is a good punishment, because you are taking away someone's autonomy fully. Right? and telling them that they are yeah. subject to the whims of someone else. And that's a devastating punishment for people. Oh, yeah. I've, I've been to, uh, uh, just since we're getting to know each other, I've been to, uh, I've made a couple short trips to psych wards over the years. And and that's, that's because I've, I've, in my very early years, I've ended up in like some junk tanks and stuff as well. So I've, I've been to jail. But the thing about the psych ward is there's no there there's no release date there is just right. literally right. no predictability of when this is going to end and uh that's not the best for it's torture i mean even health. if you start off yeah. healthy and then you're in an environment like that it's very easy to become unhealthy right yeah um and and uh, 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 another thing that this makes me think of and i uh, regarding um regarding success in this feeling of control and predictability is is this idea of these kind of fundamental attribution errors where where we have i whatever success that i have in life i have earned i got it through my own hard work and my creativity and my brilliant insights and and uh, the bad things that have happened, well, that was bum luck. Like if that wouldn't have happened, I would be more successful now. And that was just unfortunate that the universe happened to curse me in this and that way. And then uh, with other people in those out groups in particular, those nasty out groups, it's whatever success they may have had, you know, well, everyone gets lucky from time to time and then whatever whatever bum luck has befallen upon them they they made the wrong choices yeah they you just summed up hard. social psychology in a nutshell that's great <laughs> <laughs> yeah 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 um so so yeah get it get into your work a little tell, tell me a bit uh, a little bit about your background how you got into um studying what you do Sure. Well, I mean, speaking of luck and randomness in the universe, I, I would not claim to have had a, a linear path. Um, I mm. was the product of lots of those fortunate kinds of interactions. Um, so when I was in college, I, I worked at CVS Pharmacy and I did human resources kinds of things there. I did the you know training and selection and and, uh, and paperwork for new hires. And I loved it. I thought it was so fun because I was 20 years old and I felt dizzy with power. Right. And so I, uh, just got to <laughs> dizzy. Thinking. I want to be dizzy with power <laughs> one day. You got it when you were 20. I've never That's felt amazing. Like that since, though, just to be clear. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, oh, at any wow. rate, so I was doing all this HR stuff. Yeah. And then at the same time I was taking psychology courses and I thought, you know, there's so much about human behavior that could be applied to the context of human resources to improve people's working lives. And I, I just mm -hmm. wish there was a way to combine these fields. And lo and behold, there is. And that field is called organizational psychology. And so I, I discovered this uh, fairly late in my college career that this was a, a potential um, avenue for graduate study. And so I um, sort of jumped into it without paying any attention. I mean, now students are so much better than I am. I mean, they're planning, they're asking questions, they're doing their research. I did none of that. I just jumped right in. Uh, and all, they're doing, and they're doing all of that while ruining everything yes, in they our are terrible, modern of society. Yes, terrible. <laughs> terrible. <laughs> no, they're actually quite impressive. Um, yeah. Anyway, and so then when I was in graduate school, I um, I started two lines of research that have shaped my career since. One of them was about um, using technology to support education, specifically for people who would not otherwise be able to access education. So in that case, uh, rural students, people who would have to drive 50, 60 miles to go to college. Um, and, mm. and so for them, online learning is life-changing, right? Because even mm. the cost of gas to get from home to school is, is prohibitive for a lot of people. Um, so that was one line of research. The other one was about how people use technology to um, control others, actually, of all things. So coming back to our conversation about control, 
Um, and that was a line of mm-hmm. research about electronic surveillance. And, and that's still a line of research that's continuing in my lab. Happy to go on and on about so, that. Yeah. Yeah. And we will. I think that's going to be probably the focus of our conversation. Yeah. Super interesting stuff. Um, but, but could we go back to online learning just because I'm always... I'm, I'm kind of evangelical about, uh, I, I never went to college and, and, um, you know, now I find myself, uh, you know, interviewing all sorts of academics and, and much of how I do that is not researching, you know, this given academics work, like, you know, like doing a deep dive and it, what I've had the most success with is just taking lots and lots of online courses and just trying to expand broadly, um, you know, my my knowledge is in as many fields as I can make a part of my wheelhouse, so we can have you know fluid conversations and and things. And and I've found it to be just absolutely incredible that you can, I mean, you can take better courses online than you would get at your local college or or whatever you 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 can have uh you know uh, some of the top professors in the entire world some of the best experts at you know some specific thing and learn for free from them uh something that is far more than um even a local education could provide in in terms of in terms of that level of expertise i i don't mean to um uh dismiss the uh, the in-person college experience. Oh, no, I know exactly what you're saying, and you're right. And one one of the most amazing things about um, the current state of online learning is that it's a flattener, right? That you don't have to be one of the few people selected to go to an Ivy League college to have some of that knowledge available to you. So that's, it's a huge um, game changer in that regard. Um, the other thing it does is is support people who are motivated, uh, kind of independently to learn whatever they want on whatever schedule they want around whatever constraints they have in their life. So if you have family responsibilities or a job that might prohibit you from pursuing a a more traditional path, but if you can get on YouTube or get on one of the many, many online learning platforms that exist, you can learn everything you need to. I learned how to fix my heater, right? By watching YouTube videos and uh, mm-hmm. There's something very satisfying about that. The danger, though, because of course everything has to have two sides. Um, the danger is that most people are not. Great. And only two sides. <laughs> we can have as many That's sides. That's it. We, we don't. No. 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 No more sides. There's only two. All right. All right. I'll, I'll keep it to two sides then. I suppose if you insist. So. Um, The danger is that most people don't know, um, they're not great at judging their own level of mastery, right? So if I asked you, do you know everything there is to know about, you know, fixing your car's engine? Most people can't do that very well, um, especially if they're not an expert, very ironically, right? So when you're learning something, you tend to be like very bad at calibrating. And so if you quit too early um, in your online learning because you have that freedom, then you're never going to get that feedback you need to, Mm. to actually be a master. Um, it's also really easy to skip Mm. things that seem optional, like additional practice opportunities and practice is how people really learn, right? You don't learn by getting facts thrown at you. You learn by doing things, right? By solving problems. And Mm. so if you think, oh, well, I watched this lecture, so now I know it, chances are you do not and you need to practice. All right, (laughs) fine, fine. I've never done the additional things. (laughs) Well, well, well <laughs> never, never want additional <laughs> things. Come on, I, I, I mean, some, some of the classes they've, they've now built that in where throughout the lecture, you know, you get, you get four minutes into it or something, and there's a pop quiz and there's things like that. But I, I don't do homework. I, I have to be honest with you. I don't do the additional assignments and things. And and you, and you're right that I, I mean. One of one of my advantages is that I have to take the things that I learn and figure out how to communicate them to other people. So I am doing in that way. So it helps with retention a little bit. But uh, but yeah, I, I can see where if you're an average person taking an online cl- course, you go like, well, I'm not going to do homework. <laughs> I got it. Exactly. Actually, some of my earliest research was about this aspect of control in online learning. And what we found is that you can come up with multiple kinds of control. 
one kind of control is over the time and location of the learning, right? You can go to a coffee shop. If you like ambient noise, you can sit in a quiet closet at 10 p.m. or midnight if that's better for you. And that kind of control is great. It's more like just flexibility. And then there's the other kind of control where you can skip content or skip practices. And that tends to Mm. not be as great for people's learning. So some combination, right? Mm. So some freedom where it makes sense. And then also some guidance where people need guidance is probably the best strategy. Freedom with self-discipline. Sure. (laughs) Kind of. Um, Interesting. Um, cool. Well, let's, let's talk about, uh, I, I think that, um, uh, what, what I've seen of it, your, your, uh, your workplace research with, with how we're speaking of kind of mismatches within our modern society, uh, so much technology now, so many, um, uh, I mean, privacy is like, it's, it's just not a thing any, any, anymore. It's, it's just not, it, it's like, you kind of, you just got to release and be like, well, I don't think that we have, that's a thing that we really have anymore. Or at least it's a far more limited resource than it used to be. And privacy as a, as a cultural concept is such a funny one because for so long in human history, we didn't have it. There wasn't this concern about people knowing things about you. Um, everyone in the village just knew everything else about everyone else. And that's how it was. And the concept of you know personal space wasn't quite so prominent. Um, as it became clear that information can be harmful, then people started paying more attention to who had access and control of their information. And so, right. So now we're in this really interesting moment where everyone is very concerned about privacy and we have utterly lost the ability to protect anyone's privacy. That it's just, it's not possible to anonymize a data set. Even if you try, you know, very, very hard to remove identifiers, you can, you can backwards engineer that data and figure out who said what or, or who provided what information. Um, and, and I think it's it's common knowledge now that even if something doesn't seem harmful on its face, it can be combined with other information and become harmful, right? You can find someone's voter record and harass them or their health information and then fire them because they might be sick. And I mean, we certainly don't want to see those abuses of power, but we don't currently have any regulation to protect workers from that kind of um, sort of data manipulation. Uh, this That's really yeah. interesting because... Uh, but but I just want to kind of make a distinction here between our regular life and our workplace life because I I, I think in in terms of privacy, uh, there there are there's a dramatic difference where in your personal life, like sure, whatever you think you're being monitored for, your phone is listening, or this or that, or you're being tracked, and I, like. Uh, plenty of plenty of legitimate concerns there but at the same time in your personal life you can't you you could be you, like i could be naked right now on this and putting it out there and be like look at me and i i can't I, like i wish more people would like if you try to get people's attention it's very, very difficult. And there's, and there's this spotlight effect where I, I remember talking to a friend who grew up in the same kind of small town that I was and his first time in New York City. He's like, oh my gosh, I just felt like everyone was watching me. And, and I'm like, oh, no one is watching you. <laughs> no. no one cares <laughs> at all. There is, you could set yourself on fire and people wouldn't pay attention. Whereas in the workplace, it is a really different situation where where you you are a cost to your organization, and there there's this uh, striving for efficiency and organizational principles, and and so there there really is like some pretty intense monitoring going on. Sure. Well, the the variable that you're hitting on is power here, right? So. Your employer has power over you, power to control your destiny in some way, whether that's giving you a raise or an opportunity or punishing you or, or, or whatever else. Um, you're right that in, in civil society in the U.S. anyway, there aren't too many consequences for 
outlandish personal behavior, but there's still mm-hmm. lots of places in the world where you can certainly, I mean, it's, it's a crime to be gay right. in some countries still. Right. And so, right. so it, it might be again in ours. Yeah. <laughs> so we, we want to be really careful um, about taking that kind of thing for granted. And, and it's easy when you're right. in a, when you're in a sea of people who all share your same freedoms to not pay attention to that. But we could lose that in an instant if we're not vigilant about protecting it. Uh, so, mm-hmm. so right. So the fact that Good all that point. data is out there, the fact that I can tell all kinds of really personal, intimate things about you just by the data you leave on the internet right now, you can be sort of cavalier and say, well, whatever, who, what, what are they going to do to me? But that could change. Right. And then, and you don't want to be in that kind of situation. Mm-hmm. So, um, other scholars besides myself pay a lot more attention to uh, the kind of public domain. And I, I do focus more on the work domain because of that really clear power dynamic. Um, what I see is really interesting lately is that when everybody started working remotely, and I, should, I shouldn't say that, I shouldn't say that everybody works remotely. It's, you know, white collar uh, professions are mostly working remotely. Everyone else still has to go to work. COVID happened. There was a big salient period of time where lots more people than before that were, were working remotely. Exactly. And their managers were never really trained or given any tools to manage remote workforce. And so a lot of them, I think, panicked and were looking for any easy solution. Um, And there are plenty of companies who will sell you an easy solution to track the productivity of your employees. And so this is the Mm. appeal for them is to say, well, gosh, I can can install something on this person's computer and it can tell me how many hours they were active versus passive. And there are lots and lots of problems with this. The first one and most important one for me is that there is no connection between what these technologies are measuring and what's really important for a person's job, right? Productivity as measured by minutes in front of my computer is a horrible way to measure my performance. Most people's performance I know, right? Unless your job is to actually just keep your seat warm and then great measure that. But we want to actually measure the things that matter and the quality of your ideas mm-hmm. and the um, the way that you upkeep the organization's culture. I mean, all of these things matter and are not captured by these gadgets that are being sold. So that's the biggest problem mm-hmm. is that they are measuring a wrong thing. Second biggest problem is that they are invading people's privacy for no reason, <laughs> right? That they are capturing private information in addition to public information. Um, so right now in my Zoom mm-hmm. background, you can see the books on my wall and I don't mind, but maybe there's a book on there. That's oh, I'm, a- I'm zoomed in and I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm judging. Believe me. <laughs> These are all my workbooks. So they're probably very boring, but uh, I keep my interesting books elsewhere. That's what I'm judging. <laughs> I want a bunch of boring books. <laughs> my other bookshelf is where I keep my interesting books. Don't worry. <laughs> yeah, yeah. All right. Yeah, so, so you don't want people to have to sort of involuntarily share this information with their employee or with their employers, right? Why should I have to show them where I live and what kind of situation I live in? Like, why is that part of my job requirement? Um, why do they care if I was working at 10 PM or 10 AM or whatever? If I got, if I accomplished my goals, then it shouldn't matter how I accomplished my goals. Right. And most work can be measured that way instead of just counting the minutia and the and turning everybody into bean counters. But that's what these technologies are doing. They're turning people into bean counters. You know, I've never thought about that particular aspect of kind of the the Zoom background judgment because I've I've I've, it, I've, I've had plenty of jobs in in my life in my in my younger years, but. Um, and and so I'm not unaware of <laughs> how regular work works completely, but the idea of having some remote job where not only are you um, you know owned by, uh, for that you know you you are trading uh, yourself and um, and the opportunity costs of other things that you could be doing for that eight hours a day five five days a week or whatever. But now I got to clean my room too. (laughs) In addition to what Mm. that's uh, that had never occurred to me until you brought that up. That's that is, that isn't, you know, I've, 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 I've talked to with, uh, I didn't start doing remote, um, 
podcast until COVID, and I've, I've certainly before that been to plenty of scientists' homes for recordings and things. But um, but yeah, to for your boss to like see what your kids look like when they run in the bat uh, in the background or yeah. just and people have enough pressure weird... right to appear perfect right. and so now this is just another way that they have to appear perfect uh, i mean the truth wow. is that has nothing to do with your job performance right it doesn't matter right. if you've got kids running around screaming in the background what matters is whether you have met the goals that were um given to you that you're being paid mm-hmm. for but again, most managers, I mean, coming back to our point about control, they want to feel a sense of control. And for a lot of them, when their workforce became remote, they lost that sense of control and didn't know what to do instead because they were used to managing by walking around and checking in with everybody and they, they sort of panicked. Unfortunately, we've got I mean, unintended consequences now. Don't you think of a little bit of it as maybe when you're in a position of management I, 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 and I'm not, again, I'm not um, dismissing um, like uh, the importance of those jobs, but, but there is a, uh, there is a need to show what you're doing as a manager and to yeah. validate your own, um, you know, like I, I know that um, I caught some breaks early on and, and uh, got on, uh, got on, Conan several times and stuff. My my first appearance on Conan, there was like two talent bookers. They did the music, they did everything, and they just saw me at a festival and they're like, "Oh yeah, well we'll have him on." I literally told them what I was going to be saying like over the phone in in uh, Chinatown in New in New York. Like I didn't send a audition tape or anything like that, and. And the, my next couple appearances were, were the same, and then they brought and then they brought on a uh, uh, specific comedy talent booker uh, who who I love and is a friend of mine. But once he got that job, then it was like a six month process of carefully crafting this thing, and it, 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 like metal, it, 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 it he was like meddling too much in. And uh, what I already knew, what comics already knew worked a hundred times on on stage and everything. And then like a lot of micromanaging of of things just because that person needed to validate why they were a full time employee there, you know? Right. Well, I'm, I, I think you're, first of all, completely correct that the managers are not um, the decision makers in most cases. They are subject to the same system. That everyone else is, and they feel pressure to produce numbers. Um, there is nothing wrong with measurement. That's a really important point. There's nothing wrong with measurement as long as you're measuring the right thing, <laughs> and as long as you're setting the consequences in a fair way. Um, the reason that measurement is necessary is that you can't fix a problem unless you know it exists, right? And you can't know it exists unless you're collecting data about it. Like what we couldn't fix climate change, for example, if we never measured temperatures. Like we have to, right? Um, in this case, though, we're not measuring icebergs, we're measuring people and people react to their environments and they want to feel a sense of control. And when you apply all these constraints, it can be, it can have the opposite effect. Um, there's a, there's a personality characteristic, it's called reactance and reactance is like what every two year old has where you tell them no. And it's like, you have to do that thing once you've been told no. Right. And so lots of adults have this actually college professors are famous for it. They love autonomy. (laughs) And so when you tell a person like that, no, you have to follow these rules and we're going to count your metrics. It's, it's infuriating. It's like crazy making. Mm -hmm. And all they want to do is something other than that. Um, And my, some of my past research has shown that when you use electronic surveillance, um, highly reactive people will find ways to even the playing field that are not part of the metrics. So for example, um, putting in extra effort, contributing new ideas, um, being kind to your coworkers, none of these things are tracked, right? But Mm -hmm. if I'm feeling like I'm overly surveilled and I'm annoyed about it, I will withhold those behaviors in order to kind of even the scales and say, can't, you can't get me. Interesting. <laughs> so it's again, wow. you know, unanticipated consequences and really counterproductive in most cases, which is why you shouldn't just throw a wow. technology at a problem and hope that it will solve it. 
Wow. Makes perfect sense when you say it, but yeah. boy, I would have never thought of that before. Yep. Yeah. Cause it, cause it, if you're going to increase my demands in this one domain, well, then I'm going to withhold in these other domains that, that you, you can't measure. So I'm, right. And there are many, uh, many famous examples of that in history um, that led to horrible disasters, right? You can think of space shuttles exploding or cars crashing or um, just really bad public safety decisions that were made because people were too focused on one kind of metric and it gave them tunnel vision and they stopped thinking about any other kinds of important variables. Uh, you you want to throw me some of those examples? <laughs> that sounds very interesting. Um, I, I, I mean, I, I don't want I don't want to pressure if you don't have anything off the top of your head. No, sure. I mean, the most famous one would be the cool Ford Pinto. Studies? So um, with the Ford Pinto, they said, listen, you need to build a car that weighs under 2,000 pounds and costs under $2,000. <laughs> like, you know. <laughs> we did it. Exactly. And they did it, except Fireworks. it exploded. <laughs> right? So they were under such yeah. intense pressure to keep the price down and keep the weight down. And they just, again, got tunnel vision on those two variables. Another example is Enron. Um, people were so focused on the short-term goals because those goals were so heavily measured and incentivized that they lost track of long-term goals, long-term goals like the you know health of society and ethics and, and the macro picture. Um, the, the short-term things were emphasized so much and monitored so carefully that it, again, gave people tunnel vision. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah, I, you, you brought up the uh, space shuttles blowing up too. What, what was that? What, that that was I I, rem I remember that because I was in I was in grade school and they brought in the TVs for everyone to watch. That's <laughs> oh, terrible. And, and I mean the the report. So after the Challenger disaster, some of your listeners probably have no oh, idea. What was we're it the, about. the the yeah Challenger disaster? What was that like eighty seven or I something think it was like that? Yeah, and the um the rubber gaskets um fuel tank. See, it, they, yeah, they yeah, like become, sea valves or something. Yeah, the, the yeah, O rings. Yeah. They become rigid when it's oh, cold. O rings. Out. I knew it was a letter and something else. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You were very C close. Sea valve O rings. <laughs> Very close. You get, you get where I was going. Absolutely. Uh, so the engineers all knew. They knew that this was dangerous. But the people um, who were in charge of decision making had so much intense pressure about, you know, return on investment, essentially, for, for developing these, these rocket boosters that they ignored very good advice from the engineers and it overruled them. You have this public commitment. We have a space parade that we're showing. We're making this whole stink out of it and we're showing it to grade schoolers with this, this gotta needs do it. to launch. Yeah, we got to do it. Exactly. And yeah. then there you go. So incentives can be really harmful if they incentivize the wrong behaviors. You have to think about as an organization, what do I actually want to see? Right? You want safety and health and ethics and these things to be forefront. But if you're not measuring and rewarding those things, you will not get them. And so you can't be surprised when, when you don't. Hmm. Hmm. Very cool. Well, I, I, I did a lot of factory work um, before comedy. And, and uh, well, one, one job that I had was, was piece rate, where it was like, you, you know, this was a very easy to measure this was the units that you produced is what you got paid there there was a base pay that you would get and then if you made you know 150 percent if you were supposed to make a hundred of these um like molding things for furniture in an hour and you made 150 you would make 150 percent of your pay and you know that that was like Manual labor, very, very easy to quantify um, metric in, in most ways. And, and trying to scale that to thought work uh, seems impossible. I mean, most of my, my, my life for the summer putting together this festival, it's a lot of um, adulting and emailing and That's stuff terrible. making so sorry. connections during the day. <laughs> Um, I, so I have a lot of fun and then, and then most of my, most of my stuff, is, most of my best work just generally has happened at the end of the day in front of a campfire by myself, like, you know, listening to various bands that we might book or whatever, and just coming up with silly ideas and innovating and being creative, way, way more useful than my, um, 
most of the emailing um, that I do. But emailing is really, you could look and say, Shane sent 25 emails today. That was his amount of productivity. It's impossible to be like, he came up with this uh, ridiculous idea for a space dome or something like, you know. Exactly, exactly. And and there's a special irony here too, because um, there are so many people now who are concerned about automation and job loss that you can you can automate most work processes. I mean, that's not actually true. We can come back to that later, but there is a fear that that's true, that, that automation will take over all of our jobs. Um, my first job actually was also doing piecework, soldering little air conditioning circuits. Uh, and, you know, like you said, just make a whole pile of circuits and then you're done and you get the number of dollars that you, you know, you earn that day, but most work doesn't look that way. Um, mm-hmm. The most human kinds of tasks are the ones that are hardest to automate, like creativity and innovation and they say non-routine cognitive activities, right? Not doing the same thing every day, but solving new problems every day. Um, planning a festival is a great example of that. Every single day is presenting a different kind of problem for you to work on. That's really hard to automate because you have to teach whatever you know routine or algorithm a completely different environment every time. So we're in the situation where we're we're you know worried about automating work and the, the most human work is the most difficult to automate, um, and we're we're essentially turning humans into autom- automatons by by measuring every aspect of their behavior as if they're machines. Right. Humans are not machines. That's why they're great. Uh, and we shouldn't lose that. We shouldn't lose sight of that. Yeah, that I mean, that has it, I love science and and making falsifiable predictions and and, uh, you know, kind of the things that I'm about to say are far more flimsy <laughs> and, and, and philosophical. Um, but but it just seems like. Uh, it, if you know the the brain is great at learning these patterns and habituating and if if that's what's being drilled into your head for 40 hours a week this kind of um autonomous automaton kind of efficiency yep. Yep. I, I, how do you then not like project that onto your world view <laughs> that that so that's the, the way the world ought to operate it's 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 now been drilled into you so much it's right it's you can't help it on some level and that kind of um performance orientation of of like check the box automatic kinds of behaviors is not only is it very terrible for your soul um which is not a technical Mm -hmm. term but still important right (laughs) it's very bad for your soul we get it (laughs) it's also bad for learning so and I said earlier that learn, you know, we learn by watching others. We also learn by messing up and making mistakes. That's a really, really great way to learn something is to try it and then discover what doesn't work and then keep trying things until something does work. Now you've learned that thing really well. Um, when you're, when your performance is tracked so heavily like that, people become very concerned and afraid of making mistakes because that mistake will show up on the record which means they never try anything Mm. new, right? So their job becomes super narrow. It Mm. becomes the most narrow thing that they know they can do well. And there's no risk taking and there's no growth and there's no challenge. And all of those things are essential to our well-being also. I mean, we need to feel like we're growing every day and we're being challenged every day or we wither. Mm. Yeah. And just kind of the role and, and play and, productivity and and having having that um yeah there 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 needs to be there needs to be a a element of i I mean a lot of a a lot of play is taking benign risks and and if every single day at work the stakes are just so high how, how do you how in the world do you do that? And uh, do you think that, um, do you think that because all of this is just, you know, it's changing so fast and if it, it, even in the scope of evolutionary time, the agricultural revolution was like two days ago, right. like tops. Right. 
and 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 like the industrial revolution was like an hour ago and it's and and you had people discovering because it, it is counterintuitive i'm a boss i'm paying you to be here for eight hours just make as many of these things as fast as you can for eight hours. What's the best way to do that? Just work as hard as you possibly can and as fast as you can for eight hours. And it took people breaking down and being inefficient and people being like, what if you give them like a 15 minute break from time to time for bosses to be like, oh, well, that's counterintuitive, but we actually got more work, more product, more end result out of those people that we gave these 15 minute breaks to. And I, oh, we threw in a lunch. Who would have thought it? You give someone 30 minutes of not working time and they work better and are more productive. And it doesn't it doesn't feel like that would would have, you know, in in uh, try, trying to. um I, I, I guess in trying to be understanding toward just a, a a natural intuitive feel from where a CEO or something would be coming from at the it doesn't it doesn't really make sense until you learn and the research is and, and I feel like things like play and creativity are now just starting to um, permeate into uh, more of the kind of workplace. Uh, site guys. I think that's right. I think it's a side effect of an excessive focus on short-term thinking at the cost of long-term thinking. So if you need to show a return at the end of every single day, you don't have room for experimentation, right? You don't, you don't, because then you won't hit your numbers that day that you were tinkering around. But just imagine a, a farmer in a field um, picking a crop. And if they need to produce some, some number of bushels at the end of the day, they're just going to get out there and get as many bushels as they can. But if instead you said, let me see how much you can produce this year, maybe they take a week off to innovate the way that they grow the vegetables or the way that they pick them or, Mm. you know, come up with other creative strategies and the ultimate reward is much higher, but we don't set up society that way. We set up society to focus on super short-term behaviors and then you get this kind of short-term thinking. The, the benefits of creativity and play and exploration don't show up that day. Right? They show up way later. Right. Um, and it's sometimes difficult to connect the outcome to that spark of inspiration that someone had. And so you really do have to take a step back. Um, most companies, if they're publicly traded, don't have that luxury because they need to show returns every quarter or they, you know their stockholders become upset. And so this is the system we've set up. We shouldn't be surprised that, that this is how people behave in that system. Again, I don't want to put you on the spot. Um, if, if this isn't uh, research that, you know, I don't know is a perfectly fine answer, but um, what about um, any kind of uh, cross-cultural research on, on this subject? Are there, <laughs> are there big differences? So I'm not an expert in um, cross-cultural differences, but there are people who look at perceptions of time cross-culturally. And I can say that the way we think about time as linear is not universal. Um, The way we think about doing um, kind of multitasking and punctuality and all these these, um, sort of implicit beliefs about how time works, these are all cultural concepts and they are not shared elsewhere. Mm. Um, The unit of time matters. There's some really cool research, not from me, looking at how calendars shape the way that you're thinking. So if you've got a calendar, you know, blocked off into one hour chunks, you start thinking of work that goes into one hour chunks, which is like small work, right? But if you you had a day, then that's big work. That's thinking work. Um, So, right. So these little cues are subtle and most people don't think about them, but they're really deeply ingrained and and what you think about when you think about time. Ah, oh, thank you for validating my non-use of calendars. <laughs> uh, I, I almost, yeah, I store almost everything in my mind. Um, that's and, incredible. Until it I, gets a little too crazy. I, that's <laughs> inconceivable to me, but I am very impressed. Yeah. 
I mean, I have an assistant that does like a, a lot of my calendar stuff and tells me when I have things coming up, but I just don't. I'd prefer to never look at a calendar if I didn't have to, but I just missed something yesterday. So that it, it comes along with apology emails. But, uh, There's probably but I, a balance somewhere. It, yeah. There, well, it's like, uh, it's like I used to, um, uh, I, I think I I mentioned this. Actually, I, I hope I'm not repeating my. This is such a different interview, but I might be repeating some things because you're interviewing uh, Anne McLaughlin um, during during the camp uh, the campout festival, and uh, just had her on talking about human factors and and things. And I think when I was talking to her. Maybe it's a different episode anyway. Now I'm talking too much. It was about how G- uh, GPS is. Like when I, I I moved from Wisconsin to Boston and I found myself with some jobs where I was doing a bunch of delivery. This is before GPS. And I learned all of New England so well. I just, it, in such a short amount of time, in like a year, I just knew my way around so, so well because I had to. And then GPS came around and I can't, I can't get my way home without a GPS, like not even, not even close. Like I, I, within, I can turn off my GPS if I'm like two minutes away <laughs> and that's about it. And I feel the same way with calendars where it's like, I, I sort of, I like know what I have coming up and it's in my head. And then, uh, the more I use calendars, the more it just like, then I look at a calendar and I'm like, oh no, I forgot about this thing. If I, anytime I offload something from my brain, then it, it's just somewhere else. But it that's just doesn't adaptive, exist in my right? Brain I mean, anymore. that's you adapting yeah. really well to your environment. And that's what human brains do best. They adapt to their environment, yeah, they respond right. to their environment. So you used to have to keep the street layout and your friend's phone numbers and your memory. And now you don't. And that's great. Yeah, and right, now you can right, think right. of other stuff yeah, instead, yeah. right? <laughs> right, 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 right. You're right. Yeah, it's but you're right. We get into these problems because then <laughs> when the Wi-Fi goes down, you're utterly lost and and that's not good either. Yeah. yeah. So. yeah. Um, well, I would love to let, let's dig into some of the specifics of how people are uh, being monitored. Uh, monitored. I, I really like this article that was in. Uh, that you sent, uh, where was it? New York Times? New York Times, yeah. Where so the New York it? Times just yeah, had a yeah. really terrific, well-researched article about all the ways that people are tracked at work. Um, and and I think a lot of people found it shocking and appalling that no matter who you are, <laughs> almost every aspect of your behavior could be tracked, even if yeah. there's no good reason at all, right? There's just... It was very scary to read. It was very scary. It was, I, I, I'm not the biggest Orwell guy in the world. I've read 1984. I wasn't as impressed as most people are. <laughs> but reading that New York Times article was like, oh my gosh. Right, right. I mean, it's really, um, think of everything we've just said about how much people value control and autonomy, how important it is to learn and grow and um, how difficult it is to measure the most important aspects of everyone's job. Like all of those things that we've just said. And now we're imagining this world where everything is tracked for no reason. And the consequences are devastating for people. If they, if some imperfect algorithm concludes that they didn't do what they were supposed to do, they could be fired or punished. And that's, I mean, that's not, um, it's not responsible. It's not advisable. The worst part is that it doesn't even accomplish what they think they want to accomplish. So I recently finished a study of, um, is a meta-analysis. So meta-analysis means you take all the other published studies on a topic and statistically combine them to get a sense of overall patterns. So there have been over a hundred scientific studies of work surveillance and so I combine them in a meta-analysis with my with my graduate students. Um, the conclusion is really, really clear that surveillance does not increase performance, period. Like, full stop, mm-hmm. surveillance does not increase performance. Um, it does, however, increase stress. <laughs> um, and so what you're doing is you're stressing people out, but not affecting their productivity. So it's it's very um, it's very unfortunate that people are, are implementing these tools because they think they will improve productivity. They are not. Um, 
As far as people's reactions to surveillance, the research is always is also really clear that it's they're mo- it's most unpleasant when the surveillance is invisible and you don't know what's being tracked and you don't know why. Um, and so, so the advice I give to organizations is if you have to do it, if there's a legitimate reason why you need to track people's behavior, and sometimes there is, um, then you need to be very transparent about it. You need to involve employees in the design of the system so that they can tell you what's important about their jobs and you can incorporate that into the system and that there are opportunities for them to correct the record if there's something wrong. Right. So if I say, Hey, my, the algorithm says I wasn't at my desk yesterday. I definitely was right. There needs to be a way for human intervention to fix mistakes in the machine. So if you have to do it, Mm. you need to do it with people's well-being in mind. Um, As far as when, when is it justified? Well, In a lot of cases, it's necessary to keep people safe. If you're a truck driver, there are very popular devices that watch your eyes for sign of fatigue and they tell you to pull over if you're looking sleepy, right? That is, that saves lives. Mm. That's important. Um, You can use that same information though to, to mess with people and punish them and you shouldn't. You should use it for safety only, right? If you work in a nuclear plant, you wear a badge that monitors your exposure to radiation. That's a good thing. You should keep that badge. Right. So it is, it's right. not to say that we shouldn't measure anything about people at work. We should measure things that are in their best interest, that protect them, that help them grow and stay safe and not to turn them into little machines. Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, I have uh, I have the exact opposite thing. I work on on to- uh, I, I have a. Uh, I have an assistant that I've had for years and has total autonomy and just sends me a spreadsheet of what she did for the month and how long it took and then gets paid (laughs) accordingly. And like it's, but we we have a, we have a relationship that's like, uh, you know, very much built on trust and like partnership and we're in this together. And, um, and uh you know we grow together and and that sort of thing and so like it's a lot of it's a lot different than a corporate environment where she's just like sad for a few days so i'm like yeah oh don't work i don't want to work when i'm sad <laughs> I, I just like take a few days off i don't care right most uh, people are and, perfectly capable of judging if they need a day off right and they don't need to be punished yeah, for yeah. taking a day off it's funny. All the tech right. companies now have um, have unlimited vacation time policies, but they have a culture that's so um, competitive that people are afraid to take a day off. So the policy is only half the story. It's also you know how you support people and whether you actually allow them to take that vacation or or whether you start demanding that you were you were gone for a week. Where's your report that you were supposed to write and and. And being very, um, being expecting people to write, respond to their email when they're on vacation. I mean, these are the kinds of things that make the policy less important because the culture overrides it. Um, you know, the relationship that you and your assistant have is is closer to what we would want to see, but it becomes impossible when people are organized into companies of twenty thousand, hundred thousand people. Of course, right? of you, course. No one feels like uh, an yeah. individual. In that I mean, it's, yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it, it wouldn't. There's very little way to scale what I do up in 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 that way. In in the dynamic that I uh, that I have now, it's very like trust built and you know, right. or everything else. And we're like each other's therapists and stuff. Like that. You, you, you can't do that with 20,000 people. Startups run into this problem all the time. So when a startup starts up, it's small, right? There's a person, a founder, and maybe a few people who know them well, who join, and they have that kind of relationship that is personal and based on trust and knowing each other. As that startup grows, at some point it tips over, right? When you have about 150 people, right. not everybody knows the founder anymore. And that creates huge culture problems. There's Dunbar like, number. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> right? And so there's the people who yeah. knew the founder and, and refer to them by their first name. And then there's everyone else who's just an employee and it creates a terrible, um, a terrible mm. separation. I mean, think about the way that early tech company people identify themselves by their number. Right. Like I'm, yeah. I'm Yahoo employee number 10. And, and it, what it does is says, I'm the insider. I deserve trust. 
and you don't. You are expendable. Hmm. Interesting. So yeah, I I think I'll I'll th- I think I'll probably just play it safe and not become too successful. Yeah, that's wise. I would say medium successful is what you should aim for. That's been my strategy <laughs> too. <laughs> Less pressure. Um, so I, I I would love for you to expand on this. How about how about um, give me some of the tools that are being used today, like just kind of a little more specifically of, of how people are being tracked for because because I have a lot of. A lot of people listen to my show. I, I, I have some scientists that listen to my show, but I also have like artists that listen while they paint. I have uh, I have truck drivers, for example, like you mentioned. I, I have a lot of people that kind of have um, a job where they can kind of be doing two uh, things at once or will be listening on a commute or something like that. And so um, it, it might be eye-opening for some people to hear some of, some of these applications in a kind of cubicle environment. Sure. Well, I, I, maybe I won't talk about cubicles first, but I'll talk about them second. So I think oh, sure. delivery drivers and platform drivers is a great example. And and maybe some of your listeners are, are doing this kind of work and experience this. Um, if you drive for a platform service, your phone is your office. Essentially, your phone is also your boss. And it can track a lot of things about you. It can track how fast you're going because your phone has an accelerometer. It can track um, what you say and how you say it through sentiment analysis. And and it can track where you go, obviously. right? And it, all of those pieces of information can be used to um, intervene and or punish you if, if there is some issue. So if you are detected to be an unsafe driver because you brake too hard or you take the turns too fast... They can just take you off of the platform with no warning and no notification and say, you know, mm. you are not a, you are not a driver for us anymore. Or they can hold you to really unrealistic productivity standards. Um, I think you know FedEx and UPS were um, getting a lot of heat for this. Amazon as well because their delivery drivers were behaving really unsafely because everything about them was tracked. It's like every stop you make has to be under two minutes or you're in trouble, right? So those are some of those are that's one example of the kinds of tracking. As mm. far as cubicles, while well, your webcam is an example, so your webcam can capture what you're up to all day. Um, there's a device that sits under your desk that can measure whether you're sitting at your desk physically. Um, it was originally invented to for environmental planning for buildings. Like if the building's not occupied, you can turn off the air conditioning. But then people got clever and started using it to see who comes into the office first. Uh, there are, you can use a person's RFID ID tag to see where they go throughout the day, right? So tracking, you know, which doors they go through based on the, based on the tap access to different doors and that information can be stored and potentially used to, um, punish somebody. Um, you can install software that tracks what's happening on a person's monitor. So like a continuous screen capture, or what the keyboard is doing and then store all that information. I mean, really um, incredibly, incredibly invasive. Um, again, yeah. frequently not disclosed. We can get even more dystopian if you like. like even <laughs> just to see, even this is the least of it, but even just to see my typos, even, even just to see that like, I struggled to spell a restaurant or something like that is that's an invasion of my Well, and it's a source of distraction, if nothing else, right? If some part yeah, of your brain, yeah. even if it's a little part, is thinking about the fact that someone's watching you. Yeah. And that's going to affect yeah. your performance. I mean, when I set up my offices, I always um, set it up so that people who walk in the door can't see my screen, right? That I'm facing the door because I just don't want anyone else looking at my screen. It's not that I'm doing anything that is a problem. I just don't want that. Um, so that, that freedom is taken away. Um, in some cases they are, um, they're also measuring physiological aspects of people's, um, behavior. So your heart rate, um, through your watch, like if you have a smart watch, um, or your body temperature, uh, in some cases this is necessary for safety, but in most cases it's not. And so there's really no good reason. Do you think the future will be a lot of negotiations of, of like, you can have my body temperature, <laughs> but you can't monitor my screen? I mean, I think what's going to happen is that 
Um, in the U.S. anyway, unions used to be a much more um, salient part of people's experience, right? They were thinking about unions as, yeah. as on their side and protecting them from abuses. And I think a lot of people forgot how important unions are. Um, and so I think yes. now we're going to see more, um, more of a role for organizers to protect the yeah. rights of individuals. I mean, there's really, that has always been the way that worker it's, rights are protected. It's unbelievable, actually. I, I, I used to work at uh, Ashley Furniture um, Factory in Arcadia, Wisconsin. I worked there for three years. And, um, and honestly, it is, it is maybe the best in, job that i ever had in terms of like there there was potential for growth and 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 uh and things like that there but uh but it was a you know large corporation factory job and you know like suicide rates and everything else were like something that were hidden um and um there there's this I just remember having so many conversations, you know, we, we get done with our shift and go to a bar and people would be like, Oh, can you believe these unions in Detroit where they're getting, they're asking for double what we're making. I, what, what, why don't you want double the amount of money that you're, why are you mad at the people that you're, like in one conversation, you're talking about how little you're getting paid. And then in the next conversation, th this is again, like a, so a social thing of, of, you know, people would rather have the largest trailer in the trailer park than the smallest mansion in the, yep. in the, yep. um, you know, fenced community sort of, sort of thing where it's like, you're punishing your own peers really uh, uh, for this rather, rather than addressing the actual problem. In, in my opinion. Right. People, I think, I think unions have a PR problem uh, because they should be shouting from the rooftops. This is why you have weekends. Yeah. Right. But, but people, yeah, I think, have forgotten. Absolutely. Again, our lifespans are too short to remember these things. A hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah. Um, now, let me hit you with this. What do you, so, when I was a kid, I, I, should I get into like an old man voice or something when I get all nostalgic? Well, I remember when I was the post office man, he'd come by and you'd say hi to him and you'd give him an apple from your apple tree and you'd have a few minute discussion with him. You just don't see that anymore. You don't see your postman and... And uh, like old McDonald, like I literally would go to farms of like family friends and I would see like the small number of pigs in a pen being fed in the chicken coop and where the cows were milked and stuff like that. And, and, you know, it just doesn't exist anymore and it, it, everything's scaled up so much. And, and so I, I just, I, I guess what I'm after is like, how much is this like foolish nostalgia that that I'm experiencing when I think about these things and and or versus how much is like really things that have been lost within um, the new like corporate revolution of, of getting these larger and larger corporations and what can like isn't it kind of naive in in some ways to to think that it's even possible to like go back to a time where the where the postman has 20 minutes to have a conversation with you. Yeah, I you know, there's there have been a lot of positive changes too. I mean, as far as protections for um for again, you know, protections from discrimination, for example, right? I mean, you can't you can't fire someone because they get pregnant anymore. Um, you're right. You can't, you can't pay the women half as much as you pay the men in the environment, in the work. So in a lot of ways, mm -hmm. the work environment has become much safer and better and pays more. And there are all kinds of good changes. On the other hand, um, there has been a clear divide. I think we're losing the middle. There's a clear divide between many, many workers who are experiencing a lot of suffering 
and then a smaller number of workers who are protected and, and living lives of, of luxury. Um, and we're not doing enough to protect that middle. You know, middle classes are not natural phenomena. You have to protect them through policies and we're forgetting that. And so we're starting to lose it. As far as whether we'll ever get to like a, you know, post obsession with productivity, that's an amazing question. I, I think a lot of things in our culture are pendulums that swing instead of linear progressions. I think we've seen that in a, in a lot of political situations as well. Um, I think there is, it's reasonable to imagine that sometime in the future, we um, decide that we value something other than efficiency, right? And we start rewarding something other than efficiency. I think that's possible. It's so weird too, because what is efficiency? I mean, if you, if you, if you think about it's meaning like so many different things depending on context. Because if you think about the way that uh, that the brain habituates, that that is that is so much because of our brain is these pattern recognizing efficiency machines where where you go. I don't need to know my way around New England anymore. I I can outsource that and. And our brains come up with all sorts of clever, efficient ways to just lay around and be lazy by like a classical sense of the word or whatever. And and there, th- that is efficient, <laughs> you know, you know de- depending on depending on what your meaning of efficiency is. And and I think this kind of goes back to your your very early point of what is the end goal of work right. and, what, and what does productivity actually mean? I mean, you could define and efficiency as, back, is efficient? there energy in the system being devoted to something other than what you want it to be devoted to, right? So if you make okay. a machine um, that's job is to produce light and it produces heat too. The heat is a sort of inefficiency, right? It's like energy going to something other than light and it's a waste. Um, so that works fine for machines. Um, when you talk about people, <laughs> yeah, it yeah, doesn't yeah. Make, really make as much sense, right? Because you're saying, all right, are the people in this system spending their energy on something other than what I want them to spend their energy on? Um, and you can only answer that question unless if you have a perfect understanding of work and people and systems, and nobody does. We're far too complex as organisms and as systems to be able to say for sure that people should spend their behavior in these precise ways throughout the day to optimize some set of goals. Because as you very correctly said, we're pursuing lots of goals at the same time, right? So I might have a goal to make money to support my family. I have a goal to um, learn and grow in my career and develop my skills. I have a goal to make my supervisor happy. Um, I have a goal to um, contribute to values that I care about. And at any one moment, I'm switching back and forth between those goals. Uh, and so what you call inefficiency, I call working on towards a different goal, right? So that's the, that's the reason why you can't expect a a work environment to function like a, like a car engine. That's not, you know, car mm-hmm. engines don't have feelings. Right. Right. Yeah. Um, hmm. I had a shoot. <laughs> I, I had, I had something on my mind and then you said car engines don't have feelings. And then I anthropomorphized car engines <laughs> and that whole cartoon went off in my head for a second. Um, <laughs> I, um, uh, what, what's, uh, maybe, uh, maybe it'll come back to me. Um, gosh, darn it. Um, Hmm. Okay. I got to take the pressure. Oh, took the pressure. That's it. see that, that, that what just happened is the perfect example of what we're talking about. It really is. It, is, is, yeah. it, it really is. So uh, you, you take something like, um, it, it, we're, uh, we're putting, uh, putting unnecessary pressure on a system and, and in uh, putting time constraints and everything else and upping the stakes too much. Is it just like, 
it's going to make you fumble and everything else. I, I, was, I was going to, similarly, I was going to talk about shower thoughts. My best work is done in the shower. No one has ever directly paid me to take a shower. I have lost work because of not showering, I'm sure, <laughs> but that's a whole other deal. <laughs> but you, you know what I mean? Like, like I, I don't know of a single company that's like, hey, we're... We're going to we're we're, we're going to uh, pay your water bill because we know the importance of those creative shower thoughts right. that, that you're having and, and and their their role in the workplace. Right. Well, they they're so wonderful because you're not censoring them in the moment. I mean, when you think about brainstorming as an activity, brainstorming doesn't work if people are trying to determine if their idea is good as they're sharing it. Right? And they're they're mm. sort of evaluating it as they say it. That's not a brainstorm, actually, because now they're in that performance mindset again and trying to show that their idea is best or that it's smart and avoid looking foolish in front of other people. So yeah. if if you had a true brainstorm where people said whatever crazy thing popped in their head and then you had some sort of free association. Shit storming. Yeah. <laughs> have, you, have you heard of shit storming? No. Oh, so it's an idea. My my friend, he, he's a he's a business professor, Peter McGraw, who also studies humor and stuff. He 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 has a thing. Just, I don't think he made it up, but maybe he did. But it's you just start a meeting that way, which is what and the, and this is he studies humor as well and got into that. So then he started figuring out like what worked well in writers' rooms and things like that for for TV and. Um, and he has a thing about shitstorming where you start each meeting like what is the worst idea that you have and it becomes this like fun game for people and it's this safe space where people get to laugh and then sometimes people go you know what though <laughs> <laughs> that might just work and and there's like all like the show Barry on Showtime which is one of the most fantastic hilarious shows you'll ever see I think was a product of of uh of shit storming and it's just like a you know Im improvisation you know right I mean I think it's a terrific idea I, because again it takes the pressure off like you said I I've noticed that some people who are very shy i mean they're shy because they're they're evaluating everything they say as they say it right they're worried about whether it's smart enough and too many feedback loops going on yeah yeah and they're thinking like yeah. oh, i'm gonna sound dumb if i say that um as a as when i'm when i'm teaching a course i think it's universal that you want to start the first day by getting to know your students and do some kind of icebreaker and i used to do the same thing that everyone does which is ask for a fun fact and i noticed that people really got stressed out about this task that, that something is, <laughs> as, as mild as tell me a fun fact about yourself because they were evaluating like, is this actually fun enough as a fact? I don't know. Um, how fun is it that I like popsicles, you know? So, but then I started asking them to tell me a boring fact and it went so much yeah. better. So I think it's exactly what you're describing. Oh, that's funny. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Before that, did you have people like bringing a lot of Snapple into your classes once they knew that they're, you're, they're going to get this question no. it's a weird reference they used to have weird oh i remember i mean that's not a fun fact about account. you though that's just a, a, like a fact about koalas <laughs> which is also fine but i see yeah. oh it was about them so then there's the pressure of like now they are representing themselves as this is the funnest thing about about me right. oh that is a high pressure situation it's a yeah, terrible yeah, yeah, idea yeah. nobody should ask people to come up with a fun <laughs> fact about themselves at the beginning of a meeting ever <laughs> but for some reason we all do tell me the most boring thing about yourself is probably my new pickup line from now on. i'm at least gonna try it out I mean, at least great. a few times if people say like <laughs> yeah, yeah. i'm right-handed i wear eight size <laughs> yeah. shoes you know i mean it's really it's, it's terrific <laughs> Uh, that's fun. Um, well, do you want to put a bow on this at all? Uh, was there was there anything that we missed, or any any like final words that uh, uh, that you uh, otherwise? Uh, this is awesome. This is so wonderful to have you. I mean, you asked terrific questions. I think we we hit on a lot. 
you know, final words. Fantastic. Remember that people we did are it. not car engines. That was very <laughs> efficient and creative <laughs> and low pressure. And uh, our yeah. eyes are only being tracked by um, some non judgmental listeners. And Great. I'm. I'm now moving a mouse around here on my computer screen. So if anyone is monitoring, it's going to look like I'm very productive and active right now. I can tell you look very and, productive, uh, yes. <laughs> I think we did it. I think we did it. Um, I can't wait to see you at uh, and, and meet you in person at the Mind Under Matter Campout Festival, 20 minutes southeast of downtown Raleigh, September 9th through the 11th with camping until the 12th where you're going to be camping. I'm so happy when like part of this is like, I'm hoping that academically minded and science minded people will, you know, get out of like, there, there's some stereotypical shells that some academics yeah. are, are in. And, uh, and, and I think that, uh, for all the, we're, we're going to have, you know, some festy kids and like the usual types that you would suspect, but I'm, but I'm really hoping that I can introduce, uh, uh, you know, a, a, a different kind of science minded, uh, odd audience that doesn't normally get to experience, um, these sorts of things and see how much fun they are. And so I'm really looking forward to having you and I appreciate you and, and coming to, uh, you, you and you and Anne McLaughlin are, uh, I'm sure, uh, people are going to be really interested in, uh, in attending that talk and chatting with you afterwards, especially now that we know that you're uh, going to be there the whole weekend. Very cool. Yeah. I'm really looking forward to so, it. Really am. <laughs> yeah, it's gonna be great. So, thank you so much, Tara uh, Tara Baron, for joining me, and thank you, listeners, for being such wonderful, curious people. We'll talk with you next week. Bye.